warm morning to one and all present. We cordially welcome each one of you to this resplendent gathering. First of all, we have for you a session on networking, wherein we shall have a discussion on why is networking important for anyone belonging to the legal fraternity. We feel immensely blessed to have a us, Ms. Molina Swaroop Asthana, who has come all her way from Australia, taking out precious time from her compact schedule. We heartily welcome you, ma'am. Ms. Asthana is a principal solicitor with the Victorian Government Solicitor's Office for over, for over 10 years and had been primarily working on major projects for the state of Victoria. She has broad-based commercial and litigation experience and localized experience in mergers and acquisitions. She is currently the principal of Swaroop Asthana Lawyers practicing in commercial law. Ms. Molina's areas of expertise include commercial law, tendering and procurement, and contract management. Her previous Australian experience includes working in top tier firms like Minter Ellison, Mergers and Acquisitions, and Clayton Woods Banking and Finance. She has received immense awards from multiple organizations for her work as a solicitor. Ms. Molina is the first Indian born on the board of Law Institute of Victoria, which is the peak body that governs the legal profession in Victoria. She is a commissioner for the AFL Southeast Commission. She has also been a Cricket Australia Sport for All Community Ambassador and Commonwealth Games Ambassador. Ms. Molina is also a member of the Football Federation of Victoria Tribunal and also a presenter on SEN Plus program, Stockman's Brudge. She is also the founder of the organization Multicultural Women in Sport, which aims to empower migrant women from multicultural backgrounds through sport. Ms. Molina is passionate about supporting and creating leadership pathways and has been mentoring young leaders at Leadership Victoria as well as junior lawyers and law students through the Asian Australian Lawyers Association and Melbourne University. It is indeed a matter of pride to have her to enlighten and guide us about connecting and spreading our legal wings to far-fetched areas where we are yet to reach out. There's a lot more about Ms. Asthana, but due to paucity of time, we'll have to stop here. I kindly request Ms. Mr. Mayank to felicitate her with a bouquet and start the organization. We now request you, ma'am, to please start the session. Ma'am, can speak over from there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Sit down. Yeah, sit down and speak. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you to JRTC for inviting me to speak. Um, indeed, very privileged to be speaking at an event of this caliber with so many distinguished speakers as well as a, a very enthusiastic audience. Um, I would like this session to be a bit more interactive, so I'll speak for a little bit and then I'll open it up to the floor for questions. Um, I have been asked to speak about networking, uh, but before I speak, I do want to tell you a little bit about myself and put it in the context of the current topic. Um, so I, uh, I practiced in, Australia, in India for seven years, and then I moved to Australia about 16 years ago. Um, I practiced here in the Supreme Court of India in, in a commercial law firm and as well as in-house. Um, I completed, uh, in Australia I completed my Masters of Law from the University of Melbourne. And uh, however, when I started applying for jobs in Australia, I was told that my Indian background and heritage uh, and my experience was not worth much. Uh, recruiters said that it was unlikely that I would get a job at a small firm, let alone a large firm. Um, some people actually, some militias also told me that I should probably change my profession because I will never be able to get work in the legal profession and that some of the doctors were driving buses. Um, however, being a determined person that I was, um, some even called me stubborn, I chose to keep pushing, keep applying and keep talking to people in the profession. 
Um, I also, in the meantime, applied to get accredited to practice and was asked to do four subjects and six months of training to get to uh, be able to practice in Australia. My perseverance finally paid off and after interviewing with many law firms, I finally got a job at top tier Clayton Hughes um, in the banking and finance team. They even agreed to give me time off to do my subjects and for the work that I was doing here there to be counted as internship. I then moved on to another top tier firm, Minta Ellison, in mergers and acquisition, having rejected offers from a few two other mid-sized firms. Ironically, when I was working there, I got a call from a recruiter who had told me that I'd never get a job. And when I told him I was working at this firm, he said he's got an opening for me at a small firm. And I said I'm already working at this top tier, and he really collapsed. He couldn't figure out how I got this job. Um, I, but I soon realized that uh, big firm lawyering was not to my taste, um, having an interest in serving the community and needing the work-life balance. I therefore moved to the government um, and was with the Victorian Government Solicitor's Office for over 10 years, practicing in the commercial area, as has been previously been mentioned. Um, I have recently now started my own commercial law practice and want to focus on India-related work. I also do a lot of work in sport, uh, mainly in pleasing and participation of women of diverse background in sport. And having my own practice now gives me the flexibility to be able to follow my passion as well. Um, however, the journey in Australia, I realized that diversity in the law, or for that matter in other industries, was not valued much. I therefore started advocacy for creating more diversity in the legal profession, as well as in other professions as well. And that has been the basis of a lot of my work in Australia. I now sit on various boards and committees and advocate for greater diversity in the high echelons of all professions. You might be wondering why I'm telling you all this and what's this got to do with to the topic of networking. Firstly, I don't want you to think that my journey has been easy. I did come from a, I had it relatively easy in India because I come from a family of legal luminaries. But when I went to Australia, it was a complete shock to my system that my degree was not recognized, that I would not get a job. So nothing was handed to me on a platform as contrasted in, to in India. Um, everyone goes through adversities and how you change these into opportunities is the difference between winning and losing. I think my entry into the legal profession and by that I mean active practice in, in, and not study and my success in Australia is largely because of my efforts and particular my, particularly my efforts in networking. Uh, my first job was because of my networking efforts and that happened in India. I was attending a conference where there was a lot of Australian lawyers who were attending as well and I was introduced to some of them and I was, they were told that I was moving to Australia and that I should get in touch with them. And that's what I did. As soon as I got to Australia, I got in touch with these people, with these big firm lawyers and I got my first job through that. And my second um, and third job at the big firms also came about through networking. I did not get direct. No recruiter, as I said, was willing to put my CV forward. So I had to actually indirectly go and meet all these partners and tell them the value that I bring to the law firm. And that is why I got my job. It was all through networking as well. Um, why I'm on boards, so many boards now. Um, how what I've been able to achieve professionally and personally it to a large extent has been because of my networking efforts and I'll share with you a little bit about that a little bit later as well and now I'm, I'm, I'm actively working to create these opportunities for other others as well so you too can gain from networking I think it's particularly relevant for law students and legal professionals in an era where there are more law students than jobs and slowly the cluster of commercial law is growing, networking becomes imperative. Uh, networking can help you understand opportunities, new areas that may be of interest to you. So I have gone into sports law now. Uh, there's areas like privacy, information security, uh, data handling, and all these areas that are coming up, you can know about these areas through networking as well. The working at a big Talk to your firm is not the be end and end all of a lawyer's life. There are so many opportunities out there and you can learn through them by networking. Not all of that information is av available to you at universities or even in, uh, professionally when you um, apply for a job. You see those opportunities when you meet people and they're working in those areas. Uh, so you get to know about that. It also provides you with an opportunity. Networking provides you with an opportunity to tell someone about yourself 
um, that, in, that you may not be able to tell in a formal interview because that's very tailored. Here you can tailor your, that's very formal. Here you can tailor your pitch according to your skills. You can tell them what you're excelling without really being asked about it. Um, and you can tailor it according to the person who you're talking to as well, depending on their interest. Um, and if you're already in practice, networking helps you get clients. I started my own practice solely on the basis that I could get these clients to my networking skills. For years in Australia, I was doing a lot of community work. I was networking, I was attending events almost every day. I met so many people through that and they were asking me to do their legal work. Working for the government, I obviously could not. So I decided that I'll start my own practice, uh, having built that network over a period of time. That's really important for lawyers. Also, you can create opportunity. The more opportunities you can create for your clients, is important. These days, the work of a lawyer is not just about doing the job, it's about um, creating those opportunities for your clients. And business opportunities could be other opportunities by linking them to other people. And you can do that through networking as well. Um, you're li more likely to retain a client if you create those opportunities for them. And, and also finding work is not through, uh, I mean, solicitation in Austra India is not allowed. In Australia, it is. So you solicit, if you're not allowed solicitation here, how do you go and find these clients? It is a largely through networking as well that you can find these clients. Now, in Australia, I'm the vice president of an organization called the Asian Australian Lawyers Association. And we are working for greater diversity of Asians in, May, in, in the legal profession, in the higher echelons of the legal profession. We recently organized a speed networking event, especially for uh, younger lawyers. And it was just people were paired against each other for two minutes each and talk about what you're doing. And through that, we did create some opportunities for uh, some of the uh, graduates and younger lawyers. But uh, networking doesn't always have to be formal. It can be informal as well. So you can network at a party or even a family function. I do that all the time. If I go to a party at time, talk to people about their interests, I get to know so many things, and I, sometimes I find clients even at these parties. Um, so I think informal network meetings are equally important. And even catch-ups, I, I think catch-ups are also networking opportunities. So when you get an opportunity to catch up with someone, one-on-one, -on -one, try and make the best impression. That's where you can actually, you, you never know where an opportunity is coming from. So I'll tell you a little bit too, about two of my board positions that have come about through networking. So one of them is the Graduate House of the University of Melbourne. I got that because I was mentoring for a program at Leadership Victoria. Uh, mentoring young lawyers, uh, young leaders, and I met this lady, and we, we they just started chatting and about our interests and you know how our mentor mentoring ex, uh, experience has been and who who our mentees are and things. And through that uh, uh, conversation, this lady got my number and she said, "I'll contact you." I said, "All right." She next thing I know, she invites me to a, 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 the chairman's function at the university, so I go there. After that, she approached me and she said she wants me to be on the board. So I said, really, um, why? And, she's, and it was, she said, I was so, uh, the conversation we had and the common interest, I think you can bring a lot to the, uh, in the organization because we have a, we have a big diverse um, student base, so you, it would be great to have someone like you on the board. So that just came through with my passion about what I spoke to her at that point of time. So it's, it was just net, pure networking. It wasn't even, I wasn't even doing the networking, I was just putting my best foot forward. And another one that I came about because my daughter's, um, uh, uh, there's a classmate of my daughter whose mother is an executive recruiter. She, we just got to know each other through parties, parents' parties, and she added me on LinkedIn. And she's been following me on LinkedIn, and this opportunity to be on this board came about. And it, it's a very good opportunity, and she just put my name forward. She said, I'm not even going to interview you. I just want you to meet the board, uh, the, the people who are going to uh, uh, get you on the board, and, and maybe if they like you, can be on it. And I went and I, I got selected. That was again purely just you know networking. It's any opportunity could be a good networking opportunity for you. So for networking to be effective, it, effective, it has to be with a purpose. This does not mean that it has to be regimented. Uh, you've got to enjoy it, but go with the strategy. So I'll give you some pointers on being a good networker. Uh, so when you do go out to anywhere in a big function or an event even like this, find, find out first who will be in the room uh, as much as you possibly can. 
then you you would know that you want to talk to this person or that person who's you you more interested in so go and try and get an opportunity to talk to that person if you get lost in a room trying to you know you've got 100 people there you don't know where to go and you flip from here to there you may not be able to achieve the maximum amount of networking so try and find the audience that's going to be there move around the room don't try not to get stuck with one person um there are ways of doing that in a very polite manner but um you you can just say okay i've seen someone across the room who i know i'm just going to go and speak to them but try to avoid getting stuck in a conversation that you're just doing for the sake of it and you don't know how to move out of that because there's a lot of people in the room who you may want to interact with if you don't know any so when you're talking to someone if you don't know anything about that person you may know already but if you don't first try to get the information about what they do and what their interests are and don't just start your own pitch about who you are because it may not be of interest to that person so you got to find out what their interests are before you start talking about your own uh, find a common interest it's always good when you find a common interest or a common friend because that facilitates the conversation and you're able to push forward your whatever you want to say in a more effective manner and they're more receptive to that as well um, have an elevated pitch ready of course stay in according to the person uh, that means that usually means what value add you can bring to the table so for me when i went and i was networking to get a job or whatever it was always or oh, this is the value i can bring because i've got this india experience or i've got this experience or that experience have that ready kind of in your mind and especially if you know the background of the person you know what you have to say um don't ask for favors especially in your first meeting um uh, don't be pushy and don't brag um i get a lot of requests even through linkedin or directly first question people will ask me ma'am can you get me a job in australia why would i give you a job in australia i don't know you from a bar or so i need to know more about you i need you to tell me how you can add value to what i'm doing and then i can even consider you you can't go and start saying you meet someone who you know can give you a job just don't go and say give me a job because that person not inclined to do that um see how you can be useful to a person i always say you give them value then they will give you uh, importance i network with very high end people in australia even ministers and others i never ask for a favor i never ask for a favor i always say i can do this maybe i'll invite you to this i can get you to this what would you like this or that and that's when i get my what i want because they just give it automatically i don't have to say that So that's one way of doing it. It's a good way of doing that. Um, and also, the last thing: remember always to be genuine about what you're doing. If you're fake, people will see through that. And be confident in who you are. I feel my success in Australia has largely been because I've been very confident in my heritage and my background. Because if they don't see me being proud of my heritage, they are going to think, "What is she going to think about our heritage, anyways?" So I'm very proud of who I am. I try to imbibe good values from the Australian culture, and always go in when you when you go to a new place, try and imbibe new those values as well. Um, you may not be successful every time you go and network, but I always say, if you meet that one person at an event or anywhere say even today you meet that one person who can help you in life that's a successful thing for you you don't need to meet 10 people that one person will lead to you to another one and another one and that's how your network grows so it's really important to meet that try and meet that one person um i have always found met someone useful um it and it may not be useful at that point of time it may become useful that person may become useful to, for you in a later point in time so why it's important that's it's that's why it's really important for you to follow up when you meet someone when you said you want to follow up follow it up add add them on linkedin linkedin or send them an email try and even arrange for a cup coffee catch up that's what i always do if i find that i've had a really good conversation with someone and there's commonality i always say let's catch up for a coffee and we always It, and it's always good to have that one-on-one -on -one con conversation further about your common interest. You never know what comes out of it. Um, so hopefully, I've been able to emphasize some of the benefits of networking, and my tips are useful to you. Um, you should always seek opportunities to network and open up your horizons. Um, so on this note, I would also like to mention the role of organizations like GRTC uh, that are not only bringing you opportunities uh, to network at events like these. Uh, but are also directly creating opportunities and especially internship opportunities my understanding of the philosophy um, of the organization is that every student should be provided equal opportunity to showcase his or her skills at the national level uh, by giving a simple one hour 
uh, general low internship test conducted by a GRTC intern, a student could get access to thousands of merit-based opportunities. Uh, this makes it a unique and transparent platform for, for providing equal opportunities to students. I have personally not come across anything like this anywhere. Even in Australia, there's, there's a formal procedures that are followed by most law firms that you, you need to follow to get in, but there's no common platform that brings them all together. Sometimes universities offer that facility. So I think in India it would be really good, and I would be very keen to see this come across internationally as well, maybe Australia. Um, so with that, I'll leave you to rest, uh, enjoy the rest of the day in networking, meet that one person, and hear from uh, really good speakers on interesting topics. Um, I would be now happy to take any questions that you may have. Yes, please. Good morning, ma'am. I'm Shivarika, student at Punjab University. Uh, I wanted to ask that, uh, what is the level of difference between India and Australia with regard to networking? Uh, it's a different kind of networking because, firstly, if I say as I went in as a as a foreigner, as a as some uh, as someone who's who's not from that community, so networking for me is very different over there. Here, I know the background of people. Here, I know how to interact. I didn't necessarily know how to do that over there. So, in that sense, it was different for me personally to interact with those people, understanding that background. So, I'll tell you how I used to network in the, in the law firm I work for. The top tier firms, we used to have Friday evening drinks, so that's where people kind of meet and connect. But they used to always talk about football, their football, Australian football. I didn't know anything about that. It was always about the TV shows they grew up with, the schools they went to and the people they kind of knew. I didn't know much about that being new to the country. So I had to learn about all that stuff. So for me, doing networking was following a football team. First thing, when you go to Australia, you, you pick up a football team, you pick up their colours. That's the networking. So the, on Friday evening, you'll always talk about which team is your team is going to play this, this thing and this is going to happen or who's going to win or who's going to lose. On Monday, you come and dissect the whole thing. You come back, oh yes, my team lost. Someone say, oh, your weekend must have been terrible because your team lost. So, so that's a point, common point. So you've got to find that common point first to be able to network. Sports is a big thing in networking in Australia. Talk about sport, you find a common ground. So finding, finding those common grounds are different there because you kind of, it's a different environment. Whereas here, you sort of know people's background. Here people become very personal very quickly. So when you network with someone here, you know about their family, their history, everything in five minutes. You might be invited to the house the very week, same weekend. In Australia, that won't happen. You may know the person for five years, you won't be invited to the house. So that over there, getting to know a person is a very different kind of an experience. It's more formal. Even a conversation with your colleagues, our first thing you come on a Monday morning, how was your weekend? Great. And then that's it, smile, nothing else happens after that. So they're not interested in knowing it, you're not interested in telling them, that's the end of the conversation. There's a very different kind of culture, so culturally you've got to adapt to that to network. Hello. Uh, hi, Paulina. I'm uh, advocate with Arun from Supreme Court. I'm invited to just attend this from the uh, FTC by Mr. Vivek Naraj my question is like uh, during your talk, you told that uh, after doing all the details and qualification from India, you got to have nothing opportunity, you know, in the Australia. And you mentioned that you did some four subjects or some courses you did that. Can you please just tell us what are those subjects you did and then after you got qualified or whatever you wanted to do? Yeah, so I won't say I didn't get any opportunity. I created my opportunity, so I did get them eventually. But yes, they discount your background and your uh, experience. So I had to do the four subjects that I had to do at that stage were constitutional law, admin law. Uh, property law and trust accountancy. And they are all Australian law, right? Yeah, they are all Australian based because a lot of our laws are common laws, so contract and company and all that, all British, British law, so they're pretty similar. So you don't have to do that. But I, that's changed now. You actually ask to do 11 subjects when you go. So you've got to apply to the Legal Services Board and they ask you usually to do about 11 subjects and one year of training. And if you can't get a training at a, a firm, then you have to do another course which is practical legal training and that was so everything becomes extremely expensive these days if you want to re-qualify. Okay, thank you so much. No thank you, you are a nice part. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning ma'am, my name is Arushi and I'm from Punjab University. Thank you so much for telling us about networking. Uh, it is a very important thing that we must practice. 
My question is uh, from your part of the career where you talked about working in commercial laws. So commercial laws are very, they sort of revolve around arbitration. Have you ever sort of uh, dealt with any arbitration case and if you can just throw some more light about it on it? Uh, so I'll firstly say commercial law is, um, arbitration is a very small part of the uh, commercial law. I haven't done, and that's a separate field in Australia. So a person who would be practicing commercial would not be doing arbitration. Arbitration laws, are, arbitrations are generally conducted or, or, or people who are practicing in that area usually do ADR, alternative dispute resolution or arbitration as a separate um, area altogether. So big firms will always have, to have that as a separate stream. Um, I haven't personally done any arbitration in Australia. I did some here before I left. Um, but it's a very upcoming, interesting <coughs> field as well, and especially for international law. So it falls a lot in international law as well, especially if you're doing international dispute resolution, um, ADR through in, in the international sector. So it, uh, and I encourage everyone to kind of look into that area if you're interested. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Molina. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Oh, yeah. hi. I am Shubham I am an advocate called Chartered Accountant based here in Delhi. And uh, I do a lot of NGAT matters. I just wanted to know any, uh, what kind of scenarios there are regarding commercial litigation in Australia and if there is any slight difference as compared to Indian commercial litigation. Uh, commercial litigation there is on a very large scale. So here you have small matters as well. Usually the small matters get settled pretty quickly because there's too much money that's going to be spent in litigation. Litigation costs a lot over there. So most people will not go for litigation unless it's a very big commercial matter and big firms are involved. So in that sense it differs because in India it's cheaper to litigate. So people will, and you can get lawyers of every, you know, uh, caliber and uh, I mean say, I'm not saying not every lawyer I'm sure is a good caliber but the price difference is, is there. Whereas there it's usually expensive to litigate and you do have to hire hire a barrister and barristers charge by the hour it's usually thousand dollars per hour or something and for the day they charge four thousand four hundred so it becomes really expensive when you're actually doing that and plus the difference also is in the discovery process we don't have a discovery process here whereas there you have a discovery process in litigation so that's a very prolonged process we have to do all that paper due diligence and looking at the documents and stuff that takes a lot of the a few a couple it may take up to a couple of years to do this, this discovery and then the matter starts so it's um, in that sense it's a laborious process and also it's like big as I said it's big matters that go to court. Thank you. Good morning ma'am. Hello. Good morning ma'am. I'm Apoorva from Punjab University, Chandigarh. Uh, ma'am, I would like to know at this stage being a law student in the early ages of our uh, course, uh, what would you suggest how can we connect with people for internships? Um, you mean locally or internationally? Internationally. Internationally. Uh, I think, uh, and hopefully this organization can provide you those kind of opportunities, but they don't generally, there's no place where you can actually go and find that. It depends on the jurisdiction as well. I, I, I can only talk about Australia. International, international internships are very difficult to find, firstly, because if you're interning, you've got to have some kind of a visa to be able to work there. So most people will not take you on a student, any, you know, just a tourist visa or whatever, you need a work visa to do that. And it's difficult to get the work visa because a lot of local students are not get, even getting internships these days. So having an international person come in, they have to really justify that, why they're doing it. So it is really a little bit difficult. I was just talking to um, this lady here before as well, that it's kind of now, it's become, um, if you can find someone maybe private practitioner, they are small firm and I talk to them personally, maybe they can invite you over and say that this they're sponsoring you and you can go and do that um, there. Then you can potentially do that. Otherwise they have like, if you in the process itself, it's a one year or two year process to actually apply for internship. So you have to apply in advance and there's, they assess your applications and then you go through the two phase interview and then you get selected and it's very tough. So you say one firm would receive 600 applicants, they only take 12 and it could be even more so it's 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 not that easy i'm not sure about other jurisdictions but australia is a little bit tough in terms of getting uh, in, in internships for international students uh, maybe what we're trying to do is because i sit on the um, law institute of victoria we try to look see if we can create and also the asian australian lawyers association to see if we can create those linkages to uh, uh, recognition of degrees 
so that it may becomes easier or you know the university is kind of using uh, providing those internship opportunities as well so they send some students to here in exchange some students from here can go to Australia to do that. So Melbourne University has a course in India studies. They their students come here and intern for a month in an Australian Indian firm. Similarly, maybe Delhi University or someone they can have a time and they can go and work over there. It'd be a good idea. So uh, that's what we try to push for. But I see so far there's not that much available. Thank you. Ma'am. Good morning, ma'am. I am Rhea from Gita Institute of Law. So I am a law student, so I want to ask how can I do networking as pressures are not easily entertained in India. So this is difficult to do networking. So I want to ask a few tips. Yeah, so, so if all the opportunities like here today, I think uh, you should use it as much as you can, where whoever you can talk to, try and use them because you sometimes these opportunities are created for you like with organizations like these, with conferences like this. I know the guests come and they leave quickly, it's very difficult to talk and there's too many people trying to talk as well, so it's difficult. I always suggest to people who organize events to organize a networking session. In Australia, networking sessions are really important. So even if you invite guests over like, if it's the Chief Justice or whoever, well, we make sure that they stay back for a networking session with people so that they get an opportunity to speak and at a level which is a little bit more informal. Um, I would always, I would suggest that things like that should be done here as well. I know it's a little bit of a, you conscious when you're going as a young lawyer or as a law student to go and approach someone of that caliber. But that's the difference between Australia and India. We learn not to have that hierarchy there. It's very, it's quite... Uh, easy to approach people. People are not high up on the pedestal. So I meet ministers all the time, I meet chief justices, they're my friends. We actually have conversations, we don't keep each other on a pedestal. So this person's very high up so we can't talk to them. It's everyone, I think it's change of attitude that needs to happen as well with people so that they become accessible. But what I suggest is the tips I gave you, try and talk to people when you can, be present, you know, see what common interest you can find. Um, go to, and as, as I said, you can even go to private functions, you might meet with someone over there, you can network through that, they may know someone, try and find personal connections. So you may not know the a judge, but you may know someone else who knows that person. So if they can give a good introduction to you, to that person, that's always a good way, then you can have a one-on-one -on -one kind of conversation somewhere. Um, I mean, be confident, always be confident, don't be shy. Uh, I think if you feel that you have something in, uh, important to say or you feel you can make sense, go and do it. And that's what they, they teach. I didn't study in Australia, like I didn't do my uh, schooling there. But that's what they teach kids over there. Asking a question is, is the right thing to do. If you raise your hand, you are the smart kid. It's not like in India, if you raise your hand, you're the stupid, you're the kid who doesn't understand anything. We, when I, I, I mean, things may have changed. When I was studying, it was always like, don't, people are too scared to ask questions because then you appear stupid. There they say, no question is stupid. You meant to, you just ask the question. It may appear stupid, that's fine. But that's your, it doesn't really matter. People are not judging you on that basis. I am happy. Someone first has to come. My first step in is uh, giving value to other person. So when an event we come across many people, so how one can ascertain what their interests are and where they can provide value so they take us seriously. They actually bother to follow up. They actually, as you mentioned, they actually call us on coffee and we can have a further relationship. How one can ascertain their interest? Uh, yeah, so I said two things. First thing I mentioned is try and find the audience. Here it's easy, you know who your the VIPs are, so you know who it is. Maybe there's one person you really want to talk to, the other person you may not, may or may not, from their background also know they might not be able to help. So go and talk, try and talk to that person, find that opportunity to talk to that person. But also you have to, as I said, they keep an elevated pitch ready. You can talk, tell them what you can bring to the table. I always sort of know when I go to an event, I know who I'm going to talk to usually or if I go there and I find someone you know interesting and I'm having an interesting conversation I may not know who that person is, but in two minutes I'm able to assess it's a skill you learn it through time it's a skill to learn what their interests are ask them what do you do and like you know maybe they're interested in sport maybe their interest is in art maybe so ask them what else would you you know you do in spare time ask about things that are other than their main profession because you know a lot about their profession find that commonality it's easier to kind of connect with that person um, 
I mean, it, it is. It all depends on you. It's a skill you learn over time. I think uh, some people and, and uh, if you're shy, if you're naturally shy person, it's more difficult. Try and overcome that kind of you know hitch in trying to talk to someone. Just go and approach them. Be be confident. Uh, so like, uh, so like uh, going through the Indian post or uh, studying the foundations they are working on, they might also help. What do you say? You can do that definitely. If you know who's coming and you can go through the LinkedIn post or go through the Google search, find out about them. It's it's easier because sometimes you don't know all that all their background. You may just know like the basic, the uh, like they're the chief justice, but you don't know. If you go through other things, then you might find out. Okay, this person has this interest or that, or the, where they're from, or you know maybe somebody in their family is of interest, doing something interesting that you can talk about. Uh, can I? Yeah, sure. So what, what we can do is that sometimes it's what that uh, I meet somebody and somebody is from example a middle business or a plastic business which I have no idea at all. Yeah. Is what he's asking. And so what we can do is uh, read the newspaper, learn the basic things, and just ask a very generalized question: How is the industry doing? How is the GST impacted? And that is how you can get to you uh, tell with the conversation more. Yeah, you can, and and that's important for a lawyer because every time we get a case, we don't know how much it does. What the diet is going to be. You have to learn every time you do, you have to learn about something new, anyways. So, so, so like the real estate suffered, why not the industry is connected? Yeah. Understand what the basic industry is connected to in real estate, you get all many clients who are connected with it, and a generalized question can be asked. Yeah, and you won't but always be able to get any that knowledge, but you have a little bit of that's, that's enough that to start a conversation sure. at least, yes. There was a lady over there. Morning. I can't hear you. Good morning, ma'am. Um, I'm from Ra I'm Radhika from UPS. What uh, my question is: What is the secure way of doing networking, and how to avoid the wrong person while doing networking? Uh, secure way. I can't. You mean how do you ensure that you're networking with the right person? Is that what you mean, or yes. um, because I mean securing. Uh, <laughs> It, um, it depends on your interest basically. I mean, you can't always say that it's a right or wrong person. It's, it's who's going to be important for your uh, career progression or for anything that you want to achieve in life. If that person helps you in achieving that, that's the right person. If that person is just going to waste your time, not they're going to waste your time, but you feel your time is wasted in trying to network with that person, Sometimes it's okay even if you wasted half an hour of your life, it doesn't really make a difference. But if it's just an opportunity cost where that half an hour could have been used to network with someone else who could have been more useful to you, then that is an opportunity lost as well. So, so that time is a waste. But um, you can't always ensure that it's going to be, as I said, you can't always ensure and you don't even know whether that person is useful to you at that point of time. That person may be useful to you in two years time. So you may at that in two years be, but stay in talk, contact, you don't always have to email, once, send them a new year card, send them a Diwali card or whatever, send them a greeting, so they remember you, so you can stay in touch and, and then you, then maybe that person might be useful to you in the future. Good morning ma'am, I am Web from Punjab University, like you are working in merger and acquisitions and arbitration processes. So I just wanted to know what uh, what is the future of IPR like in Australian laws in Australia or some in other country like IPR is very wide field to work in. So any views regarding IPRs you have? Intellectual property. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, there is I think there's a lot of scope in intellectual property everywhere around the world um, uh, because obviously everyone wants protection of intellectual property as well and there's inter and what will happen is the internationalization and standardization of those laws as well so when that happens then everyone has an opportunity to be able to even work internationally on that because eventually you will have to because of internet because of uh, social media because of the interaction internationally that we have all the time uh, in terms of a sale of products as well and services, it has to eventually be standardized. So there is a lot that's going on in that space uh, and, and then you have to connect it with privacy laws, data security, all that stuff comes in and so I think there's a lot of scope in that, um, in that area. Yeah. I hope there are other queries, but I'm sorry we won't be able to take any more questions due to paucity of time. 
we request you to please mail your queries to jrtcconclave.com as the given uh, email id uh, to have your questions fulfilled for now we are going to end with this session and shortly begin the session one of the uh, today's conclave thank you so much ma'am for coming uh, coming here and inspiring us with your wonderful experience it's indeed an uh, an honor to have you here thank you so much thank you